carried out under the Water Framework Directive, so I'd like to introduce Helen Clayton from DG Environment from the Water Framework Unit. Um, environmental quality standards for nonalphenol and octonalphenol under the Water Framework Directive. Thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. Um, I realise this, this may come across as very different from the previous talks. Um, I don't see many familiar faces, so I, I realise that also not many of you have much to do normally with our water um, uh, group. We have an expert water group. And, um, sorry, I'm just trying to make this work. Um, and what I'd like to cover then is a brief introduction to the priority substances under the Water Framework Directive, of which non-alphenol and octalphenol are two. Um, I'd like to look at their environmental quality standards and their status and possible review. Uh, to briefly consider the implementation of those um, environmental quality standards under the Water Framework Directive and to consider an, an outlook from the Water Framework Directive perspective. So the objectives of the Water Framework Directive are good chemical and good ecological status of surface waters and um, good chemical and quantitative status of groundwaters. And the mechanisms whereby these objectives are to be achieved are river basin management planning, which is informed by monitoring. And that monitoring is very important um, as a way of feeding back to measures that might be taken, both at national level and by the Commission, for example, at EU level. And indeed, the measures that we may take may involve and often do involve other sectoral legislation and not purely the water legislation. So this is where there are very strong links now um, and they've been better expressed in some of the water legislation. So the chemical status of surface waters is determined by the concentrations of the priority substances and there are 45 of them now, plus eight other pollutants and they're in Annex 10 of the Water Framework Directive. And that concentration is compared with environmental quality standards which are set for inland surface waters and other surface waters. Um, that's transitional and coastal waters. The Article 16 is the critical part of the Water Framework Directive and it says that um, the European Parliament and the Council shall adopt specific measures against the pollution of water by individual pollutants or groups of pollutants presenting a significant risk to or via the aquatic environment, including such risks to waters used for the abstraction of drinking water. So um, what is clear from this is that it is the aquatic environment, but also indeed human health that matter. Um, and the, um, the next point is that measures, measures shall be aimed at the progressive reduction and for priority hazardous substances, which is a subset of the priority substances, at the cessation and phasing out of discharges, emissions and losses. So I've mentioned that it's also secondary poisoning of wildlife and humans via the consumption of fish and shellfish that count. Now, Article 16 includes a lot of detail about how we should go about identifying priority substances. Uh, it refers to using risk assessments from other legislation, which include, of course, REACH. And it also refers to doing a simplified risk assessment which means that where we don't find other risk assessments, we can do a simplified risk assessment based on a, um, a risk ratio of the exposure um, and the hazard. So just to define here what we mean by priority hazardous substances, there is a definition which refers to hazardous substances as substances or groups of substances that are toxic, persistent and liable to bioaccumulate and other substances or groups of substances which give rise to an equivalent level of concern. This may seem very familiar. Um, it has been interpreted as covering substances that would be covered by Article 57 of REACH and others in other policy sectors that are similar. We've used in our reviews of the priority substances list the Joint Research Centre categorisation of endocrine disruptors. This EQS directive, which is a daughter directive of the Water Framework Directive, sets the environmental quality standards for priority substances and the eight other pollutants, and it's based on the most sensitive endpoint. That's from the environmental and human health testing. 
Um, the directive requires trend monitoring of substances that tend to accumulate in sediment and or biota. But among those substances, NP and OP are not mentioned, even though, indeed, in the dossier for the Environmental Quality Standard for NP, it is acknowledged that um, the hydrophobic form will be, to some extent, prevalent. Um, so this is an aspect that we should look more closely at, and I noted a comment was made about the absorption of NP, and um, this is clearly an issue. Um, the directive requires that emissions inventories are established and allows for mixing zones. The 2008 directive was amended in 2013 and we added um, priority substances, that's why there are now 45. Uh, we added the EQS for those and revised some. We also changed the status of two, DEHP and trifluralin became PHS. Uh, we also introduced the provision of a watch list and a strategic approach to pharmaceuticals. We changed the frequency of review of the list from every um, four years to every six. I mentioned these points. The watch list is relevant for reasons to do with the estrogens that we have been monitoring um, and which did not make it into this. We actually proposed the inclusion of alpha ethanol estradiol, which has just been referred to and beta-estradiol and diclofenac in the list, but they were not included at that point. Um, this wasn't really to do with not admitting that there might be a problem, although some, there was some dispute about it. Um, but we ended up with the compromise of developing a strategic approach, and we included those three substances in the watch list to obtain more monitoring data to assess the risk and consider the management of those substances. So. There's been a question raised as to why we set environmental quality standard if we want to phase out the emissions, because in theory we'd be aiming for zero. Um, and obviously it is, however, a target to measure progress against. And the EQS were based on the best available science at the time. Interestingly, we didn't actually make any changes to NP and OP in the last review, um, although there was some um, suggestion that we should look at them more closely, but I noticed that a lot of the information that could have changed our opinion has come since. Um, there are obviously uncertainties um, with long-term effects of chronic exposure and the effects of exposure to multiple chemicals. Um, so there are, there are very good reasons for uh, wanting to phase out emissions completely where we have identified PHS um, and it, it does make sense to have an EQS, but of course there is the question of whether we have a reliable EQS. Just to look more closely then at where these substances are in the EQSD, um, non-alphenol is a priority hazardous substance uh, on the basis of its endocrine properties. Um, it, is, it has an EQS, for, which is the annual average EQS for chronic effects of 0.3 micrograms per litre, that's for all surface waters. And it has a maximum allowable concentration EQS of two micrograms per litre, which is also for all surface waters. So there's no distinction between inland and other surface waters. That EQS is currently being reviewed. For octyl phenol, it is a priority substance, but it is likely to become a priority hazardous substance at the next amend amendment, as was actually originally proposed in 2001 when it was first listed as a priority substance. But in 2008, when its designation was reviewed, uh, it was only put down as a PS. It has an annual average EQS of 0.1 micrograms per litre in inland surface waters and 0.01 in other surface waters. There's no MAC EQS because the annual average is considered to be protective enough. And that EQS at the moment is not being reviewed. So let's go into a bit more detail of non-alphenol. The listing specifies this, in other words, gives the CAS numbers and specifically mentions the branched um, isomers of non-alphenol. Um, the EQS refers to the branched isomer and it is, as I said, 0.3. It is based on a deterministic approach and interestingly it is based on traditional toxicity and not on its endocrine effects. Um, it is the toxicity for freshwater algae, the alga um, Synodesmus uh, suspicatus, and it's to do with the biomass. Mm -hmm. 
and it has an assessment factor of 10. The MAC EQS is 2 micrograms per litre, and that's also based on a deterministic approach for, direct, uh, for traditional toxicity uh, on uh, freshwater invertebrate and um, with an assessment factor of 10. You can find all this information in the dossier, which is at, in our CERCA website, um, and it explains also the points that although there is information in there about endocrine effects, at the time it was proposed, and that was going back to 2006 when the proposal was originally made, um, the direct toxicity, the, the traditional toxicity was considered to be protective against endocrine effects, and I think a different view might now be taken about this, um, especially given the presentation we had earlier from Connor. So I'm obviously giving you this background, um, and it's interesting to compare where we are. So the Swiss have already begun to review the EQS for non-alphenol, and they have a proposal for non-alphenol branched and linear. Um, the EQS is nearly tenfold lower than the current EQS, and the MAC is slightly higher. The website that's given there is basically it's just a list of standards. It's not actually the dossier, but you can obtain it if you request it from the Ökotox Centrum in Switzerland. There is a huge amount of data in the dossier, um, all sorts of studies which they've separated into which type of non-alphenol is concerned. And they obviously have looked at endocrine effects. It is, as I said, purely a proposal at the moment, which still has to be considered in Switzerland itself for um, action. So we then have um, the octalphenol EQS that we have under the Water Framework Directive. Um, sorry, I will just go back briefly to say that we under the Water Framework Directive are considering the Swiss dossier and we have already begun to revise our own dossier on the basis of information from the Swiss dossier. And that needs to be discussed with our community, with the, with the water uh, experts. Um, so that's forthcoming. Um, so now for octalphenol, the listing specifies which octalphenols are considered here. Um, the EQS refers to this particular CAS number and it's 0.1. Again, it's a deterministic approach and it's based on traditional toxicity, not the endocrine effect. Um, it's to do with a NOEC for growth and it has an AF of 50. Um, and the MAC EQS is not, as I said before, the, the AA EQS is considered protective, so this isn't presented in the, in the uh, directive itself. But again, it's a deterministic traditional toxicity approach. And um, with an AF of 100, these AFs being higher, obviously, to do with the uncertainties, the relative lack of data compared with non-alphenol. And again, you can find that dossier on our CERCA website. Um, just briefly then to cover where we are with the implementation. Um, when we reviewed the, uh, the directive last time, uh, at the time there were reported a few exceedances of the environmental quality standards, uh, mainly in rivers for both substances. Uh, there was a comment that some would prefer to monitor in sediment and biota, and this is something that I think should be reviewed, given what I've just said also about the, uh, the properties. Um, the measures, the measures that um, have been taken in different member states uh, include some that are voluntary, but some that are legislative. There was a call for regulation in imported products, and that this review was done obviously now, that was back going back to 2010. So indeed, since then, we've seen action on that front for non-alphenol ethoxylates. Um, the second river basin management plans are being assessed at the moment, and we expect to report in 2018. And that should yield more information about pressures and sources, um, emissions and measures. And obviously, if we don't find exceedances, that's good. But it's not enough to meet the EQS if the EQS should be lower and if we want to phase out emissions altogether. Um, outlook, I can cover this quite quickly. Some relevant issues and actions, how we deal with the ever-growing list of priority substances. We are considering... Um, taking a more holistic approach to assessing chemical status under the Water Framework Directive. Uh, this is early days. We are beginning to look at the question of um, whether we could group substances more. There are currently some groups of substances in the Water Framework Directive, 
um, but there might, it may be possible to, to include more. I mentioned that we have a watch list which is monitoring three estrogens, um, beta estradiol, alpha ethanol estradiol and estrone, uh, but it's not easy because of the low limit of quantification. Um, and we have seen uh, an estrogen monitoring project underway by Switzerland, led by Switzerland, which is looking at the use of effect-based methods. And we are considering an activity, in fact, we've begun an activity now on effect-based methods um, under the Water Framework Directive. So that if activity is under our common implementation strategy for the Water Framework Directive. It's following up some earlier work that we did on, in 2014 on effect-based tools, and it's aiming to deliver some outputs by the end of next year. Um, it's hopefully going to provide some support for a more holistic approach um, and overcome some detection quantification difficulties. And obviously we need to take into account the Marine Strategy Framework Directive as well. Um, several tasks, I'll just put them up um, to, uh, you can have a quick look through. Um, I know that time's running out and um, I just wanted to include one more slide just to say that this sort of ties in with a lot of um, other things that are going on in the Commission to do with the fitness check of the chemicals legislation and non-toxic environment strategy which is looking at combination effects of chemicals, mixtures, and research projects looking at mixtures. And so I just wanted to sort of refer back to other people's presentations that have mentioned these things, and thank you very much. <laughs>